and, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's sort of nice to be back in IAD rather than sitting in a meeting on administrative matters. So I will be talking about a broad sweep of research that my group and frankly a lot of other research groups around the country and around the globe have been undertaking regarding the structural transformation that we see taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa today. My focus is on rural Africa uh, for a variety of reasons that hopefully will come quite clear as I go through this. So let me start with the kind of fairly obvious, very well-known and slightly depressing points. One of the reasons to focus in Africa, especially in rural Africa, is it remains, unfortunately, the world's poorest subcontinent. Um, the number of extreme poor, the World Bank identifies a, a global extreme poverty line of $1.90 in US monetary terms, uh, in, 19, in 2011 terms. So that's their extreme poverty line. And even though the poverty headcount rate, the proportion of the population living below that level, has been falling over the last 10 to 15 years, we still see an increase because the rate of population growth has exceeded the rate at which we're seeing uh, the, the population headcount poverty rate fall. So although we're now down to about 41% of the population living in extreme poverty by global definitions, this is still up by more than 100 million people. There are more people living in extreme poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa than in the totality of, of North America. So just to put it in context for you, take everybody in, in Canada and the United States, I'll leave Mexico out for the moment, and that population is not as large as the extreme poor in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a large population. That is, as a headcount rate, it's way in excess of the Asian rates. So there is a large mass of extremely poor people in Asia, but there's also a much larger population in Asia. So um, this is a humanitarian concern. It is a moral concern. Whatever might motivate you to worry about poor families of the sort like this Gabra family I photographed in northern Kenya, um, this is a serious issue that many of us on this campus have grappled with for a long time. Perhaps more disturbingly, the World Bank's projections are that in another decade or so, by 2030, 80% of the world's extreme poor will be living in sub-Saharan Africa. So this problem is not going away anytime soon. Population growth and some of the challenges of addressing the remote rural poor pose real challenges for us. Now in a place like Cornell, one of the opportunities and one of the challenges and one of the reasons why many of us devote a lot of our time to this sort of thing is that the poor are disproportionately in rural areas and disproportionately employed in agriculture. This is a simple graphic that shows you a breakdown of those employed in Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, the leftmost bar, 60% employed in agriculture. Other developing countries, just 35%. Now look at the working poor, those who are engaged in some sort of productive activity. Note this does not mean they get a paycheck. So in most of the world, most of the poor are self-employed whether in agriculture or some other pursuit. And about 80% of the working poor are in agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa, 60% in other developing countries. Poverty is disproportionately rural. It is strongly associated with agriculture. And that is one of the challenges that great agricultural universities like Cornell need to tackle. But it also offers great promise. Uh, and I'll come to that in just a couple of minutes. But insofar as we can accelerate agricultural productivity growth, improve the terms of trade for farmers and farm workers, we have the opportunity to have quite accelerated poverty reduction. The most troubling part of the poverty story in Sub-Saharan Africa, to me, is the depth of the poverty. It's not even the headcount. In Sub-Saharan Africa, unlike most of the rest of the world, we still have very large and growing populations that are under what some of us term the ultra poverty line, half of the extreme poverty line, 95 cents US per day per person, sort of an unimaginable level of income to survive off of, especially when we recognize this is capturing the value of auto consumed products. This doesn't just mean cash income. This means the value of everything one consumes. And the population living in this ultra poor condition has actually grown over time. So we, we see that although, I'll come to in just a few minutes, there's been relatively quick economic growth 
in sub-Saharan Africa over the last decade, and much faster than we had in preceding decades, the number of ultra-poor continues to grow, which is a, a signal to many of us of something called a poverty trap, that there are populations who find themselves, for a variety of circumstances, in situations where their best strategies in life unfortunately perpetuate their poverty, that they don't have an easy climb out of poverty without some sort of assistance or just very good luck. Um, and the part of sub-Saharan Africa's ultra-poverty that is beginning to really capture the attention of development and humanitarian organizations is that this is where increasingly the world's most poor are concentrated. Just in the generation since 1990, Africa used to have only about a quarter of the world's ultra poor. Today, we're already over 80%. Remember, the World Bank is projecting that by 2030, 80% of the world's extreme poor will be African. We're already past that mark among the ultra poor. So the poorest tale of the income and well-being distribution in the world is overwhelmingly concentrated in Africa and overwhelmingly concentrated in rural Africa. Again, kind of a, a basic moral motivation to be worrying about persistent poverty of the sort. You know, this is a, a Malagasy uh, sharecropping family and Charbonnier family. They, they make uh, charcoal illegally in the forest and they cultivate rice on other people's land and barely make a go of it. And a woman on the right uh, with her son any student have any idea what she's holding? Close, not quite. I suspect some of the faculty know what this is. All right, anyone want to tell me what, what she's holding? Does anyone know what cot is? It's a narcotic that you chew. It grows naturally in the arid and semi-arid areas of the Horn of Africa. And one of the properties of cot is that it's a hunger suppressant. Like a lot of narcotics, some will give you the munchies. This one happens to suppress hunger pangs. So the tragedy of a mother feeding her malnourished child cot that suppresses hunger pains is really emblematic of the problem that some populations face. This isn't she's silly. On the contrary, she's very clever. She's figured out how to deal with a very real immediate problem. But the fact that you have lots of people like her is a tragedy that we all really need to be paying attention to. Moreover, there are threats that things could get worse in some quarters. Climate change is the big one. Uh, there are lots of other ones, conflict being the most obvious and immediate one in some places. But climate change is a very real threat because, again, 80% of the population that is poor in Africa is working in agriculture, which is overwhelmingly rain-fed. In sub-Saharan Africa, less than 10% of agricultural land is irrigated. Everybody is rain-fed farming. When the rains start changing and temperatures start changing, livelihoods change. One really disturbing uh, implication of this, I do a lot of work with, with pastoral populations, with herders. You saw camel, uh, camel herders in the Chalbi Desert earlier. So the herd dynamics shift as the frequency of drought shifts. The graphic on the right tells us some simulation work we published a couple of years ago if we start with initial herd sizes measured in terms of cattle equivalents, because they're sheep and goats and cattle and camels all in the same system. Um, so if that is on, measured on the horizontal axis, and 10 years ahead, you look at what the expected herd size is, given the observed population, herd population dynamics we see, that's very much a function of how frequently droughts hit. And without getting into the technical details, we can reproduce the current population, the observed like last generation's worth of population dynamics pretty effectively where the, the probability of a drought of 250 millimeters of rainfall a year or less, that's very little rainfall for those of you who don't, don't quite know how to calibrate this. We get 250 millimeters of rainfall in many months in this, this particular location in Ithaca. But the probability any given year of that level of rainfall or less is about 6% in this area of southern Ethiopia. If that probability merely doubles, it's 6.4% to be precise, so that it's just under 0.13%, so 13% uh, probability of drought, the herd dynamics completely collapse in this system. Right now, it's a, without going too much into detail, there's a, a, a stable equilibrium herd size of around 40 animals where 
herders migrate in search of water and grass. They pick up and move their animals as they begin to exhaust the grass in a particular area and go to the next pasture land, the next wells. Once drought starts to hit more frequently, groundwater doesn't recharge fast enough, rangelands don't recover fast enough, and they won't be able to keep doing that. And their only equilibrium herd size winds up being basically one cow, and they're completely sedentarized. This is a population where their livelihoods depend upon remaining mobile. They're only mobile if you've got a decent sized herd. And the big driver here is climate. So these are populations desperately at risk if we don't wind up finding techniques to help them to cope with climate change that is already well underway. Now, there are things we can do. And this is where the kind of grim part of the story ends. And I start to hopefully begin to tell you slightly more hopeful things. So there are interventions we can come up with. I, my team here at Cornell has worked with uh, the International Livestock Research Institute based in Nairobi and Addis Ababa to develop a, a actually a commercial product offered through a couple of different insurance companies in both Ethiopia and Kenya called Index-Based Livestock Insurance that provides payments, just like you or I get payments from an insurance company if we have a fender bender with a car or a fire in our house. Uh, we have a medical expense, we get repaid. You suffer a loss. In this case, the community suffers a loss, not an individual herder, and the insurer pays and pays quite promptly. In fact, it's much faster to get the insurance payments than to get the relief food shipments that come from North America and Europe, which is one of the benefits of the program. We piloted this in 2010, a massive drought hit in 2011. It worked exactly as designed. Droughts have hit since then, especially the 2017 drought. It worked very well. The government of Kenya has actually taken this nationwide in something called the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program. There's a, a Sharia-compliant version now for Muslim populations in northeastern Kenya. This is a way of combating those herd dynamics that get affected by more frequent droughts. If we can insure against droughts, people can either restock their herds faster than they could through regular reproduction, biological reproduction because they can buy animals with the cash proceeds they get from an insurance payout, or they can invest in something else and they begin to shift livelihoods because now they have cash rather than just they lost a big chunk of their, their wealth, their family wealth, their livelihood. Now they can actually begin to invest in a small business. They can send a, a child to a, a, a vocational school to learn a trade, and develop an alternate source of, of income. And when we actually run the horse race between cash transfer programs in the same setting in this insurance program, we find that the marginal benefit cost ratio is, is favorable for both. Cash transfers are a good thing for these populations, but at the margin, it's an order of magnitude more attractive to subsidize the insurance and basically draw on the global capital market to provide disaster assistance. That's essentially what this does. So there are innovations taking place to help to stem some of the challenges facing these poor rural populations in remote areas of rural Africa. And you scale up the various innovations taking place, much of it driven by the private sector. And we actually see that Sub-Saharan Africa is very quietly going through this huge economic expansion. Not everywhere. It's extremely uneven. The slowest growing economies in the world are also disproportionately in Sub-Saharan Africa and largely conflict-ridden countries. But fast growing countries in recent years, Ethiopia, Ghana, DRC remarkably, uh, you, know, you have several countries here that are growing quite quickly from a low base, but they're enjoying quick growth. And what's going on behind this quick growth? Well, most of it's agriculture. Again, most of the poor are working in rural areas, most of them are employed in agriculture. And if you decompose the sectoral contributions to poverty reduction, in this case, this is in, uh, in, in Ethiopia in particular, but if you decompose where is the poverty reduction coming from, a higher number is a larger magnitude reduction in poverty, the percentage headcount reduction. And you see the big blue mass, which is agriculture, accounts for the vast majority of the reduction. And this is because agricultural productivity growth does several different things for the poor. First, most farmers are relatively poor. They're not the poorest. 
the poorest don't own land and they don't own livestock. They work for the farmers. They are herders employed by farmers. They are farm workers who prepare land, who harvest crops. So farm workers do better off when livestock and crops are more productive. There's more work for them and they get paid more. The farmers are earning more when the productivity of agriculture goes up. And the other thing that the poorest in rural areas do is they provide services largely for the farmers. They're the ones who clean houses, who fetch firewood for pay, who fetch water for pay, who provide cleaning services, who do any variety of things for ridiculously low wages. But as farm families earn higher income, their demand for these non-farm services and non-farm goods too, banana, beer, things like that, grows disproportionately quickly. And so it stimulates demand for the very services that the landless and stockless can provide. So agricultural growth has this disproportionately large contribution to poverty reduction, which is a great thing in places that are very poor and have a very heavy concentration of the poor in agriculture. One of the ironies of rapid agricultural growth is that it actually sheds workers. So this is counterintuitive to many people, but I will explain it in just a second. Um, this is really basic correlational data, just showing on the horizontal axis, the average growth rate in agriculture in a given economy. And on the vertical axis, the annual change in the share of the labor force working in farming. Notice zeros here, negative numbers are beneath. First thing to observe is in virtually all of Africa where we have halfway decent data, the share of the workforce engaged in agriculture is declining over time. So fewer and fewer people as an overall share, again, population is growing, so you can still have growth in the aggregate numbers, but as a share of the workforce, agriculture is shrinking. This is what happened in every other country in the world as its income grew, as its standard of living improved. But the countries that are shedding workers from agriculture fastest are the ones whose agriculture grows fastest. Now, why is that? That is this farm, non-farm connection that I was referring to just a moment ago. Think of your own demand for agricultural products. We all like to eat. Some of us eat more than we should. Um, but there's a physical satiation effect. There's only so much food we can consume. Double my income, I can't possibly double the amount of food I eat. But double my income, I can easily double the services that I purchase, how frequently I hear, how frequently I go to the movies, or go out for dinner with family where I'm really buying not the food, I'm buying the preparation and the ambiance and saving me the time of cleaning dishes and all the rest of that. And so rapid agricultural growth stimulates disproportionately demand for non-farm goods and services, which fuels increased employment of the non-farm sector, employment in the non-farm sector at a much faster rate than in agriculture. So the share of agriculture in the workforce falls precisely because of the productivity of agriculture. This is a pattern we've seen repeated through history in the course of development worldwide, that as agricultural productivity growth accelerates, the agricultural sector grows faster when we start having more and more output. Notice that I'm not saying agricultural output falls. Agriculture's share of output and share of employment falls. As agriculture is growing more quickly, it actually reduces, it leads to a reduction in its share of the overall economy. Anyone know what the share of agriculture in New York's economy is? Sorry? Less than that just over 1% of the economy, between 1% and 2% of the economy. You never know it driving around Tompkins County, but it's 1% to 2% of the economy. And if you just go back 50 years, it was about 15% of the economy, and New York was, at that time, the wealthiest state in the union. It's not anymore. Um, but the point here is that this is an empirical regularity. We see this happening all over the world. But the key to recognize is that the driver here is fast agricultural growth leads to better employment opportunities outside of agriculture, that the non-farm sector depends upon growth in farming. And one reason why that's really important is an awful lot of economists have fallen prey to a really basic myth, a myth that is based off of very simple data analysis. 
reflected in something like this. So this is work, really brilliant work done by a recent PhD here, Ella McCulley, who's now at the University of Georgia. So this graphic shows for four different countries' data, the output per person per year, note per year, in agriculture, in industry, in services, in, and these are using macro data. So these three, the whatever that is, green, I guess, uh, orange and blue bars are from micro household level data. The other two are from macro data. And the reference point here is the horizontal dashed black line at one. So that's where the average output per worker is exactly the same in agriculture as it is in the other sectors. So these are normalized. You notice each of the green bars comes exactly to the one mark. And what you should take away from this graphic is in each sector, in each country, the output per worker per year is higher, indeed much higher, outside of agriculture rather than in. Now, the natural thing to take away from that, and the incorrect inference made for a long time by economists, is that means agriculture is relatively unproductive. That is true by this measure. But you have to pay attention to what do we mean by productive? What is the unit of account here? And when you look at productivity per worker per year, the natural thing to think about is that the per unit time productivity is lower in agriculture. But this is what we might think of as a wage rate, the pay per time, times the amount you're employed. And the big difference in Sub-Saharan Africa is actually how much time you work. Again, African agriculture is rain fed. Without irrigation, you only get to work for part of the year in agriculture, and then you have to go spend part of the year finding other jobs. So when we decompose the household data into those whose primary employment is agriculture, those whose primary employment is working in industry, and those whose primary employment is working in services, reflected by which color has the mass of the bar, you can see here the number of total hours worked by households across these countries. And the striking thing here is how much less agricultural households work any given year than do others. That I submit probably does not reflect laziness. For any of you who've spent time working with African farmers, this is not fun work. It's backbreaking and often dangerous work. The key problem here is it's often hard to find steady, reliable work seasonally. You know, you work your farm, you herd animals, you can't easily find someone who will give you eight hours a day, five days a week, paid employment in a factory periodically, and then you disappear to farm. It's just not feasible. So people get casual labor. There is a little bit of work here in industry. There is a little bit of work in services, but they get comparatively much less time working outside their primary sector agriculture if they're primarily a farmer than do those who work primarily in industry or services spend much more time farming. School teachers keep plots behind their house. They keep cattle and chickens. And they get to spend some time supplementing their teaching earnings or their factory working earnings with farm earnings. So when you correct for the big underemployment issue in agriculture, because that's what this is, there's much less work available for those primarily engaged in farming, you get a very different story about the agricultural labor productivity in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's actually not appreciably less productive per day work, which helps to explain why we don't see this rapid arbitrage between the agricultural sector and lots of other sectors, people just quickly jumping to these really high return jobs plentiful to them because they aren't plentiful. The problem is underemployment. It's not low productivity per se. Everybody's relatively low productivity. They're pretty comparably low productivity. There are some weird idiosyncrasies in the Tanzania data that I think account for the two blips there. In Ethiopia and Malawi and Uganda, there's really not much difference in the daily labor productivity, which is really the appropriate measure for people who aren't operating on long-term employment contracts. So these are more employment gaps than they are productivity gaps. And one reason that matters is an awful lot of development policy based on the myth of low productivity agricultural labor, and in particular, a productivity 
labor productivity differential across sectors, a lot of the development strategy has been push people out of agriculture. Let's move them to other sectors and we'll get this kind of magical boost to labor productivity, but you won't if there's really no difference in daily labor productivity, if it, alternatively you can simply find means of expanding employment opportunities. And indeed, the, the productivity gaps within sectors are much larger than they are between sectors. So this is data from Uganda showing from the fifth percentile of the labor productivity distribution through the 95th, what's the difference in labor productivity uh, at household level and what you see here is that the gaps in, whether you look at urban self-employment, rural self-employment, or farm labor, the gaps across the different parts of the productivity distribution within a sector are much bigger than those gaps I just showed you uh, between sectors. So the within sector variation is where the biggest differences are, where the biggest gaps to be closed are. What that tells us is, if you think of agricultural productivity growth as an engine that sheds labor into the non-farm sectors and stimulates demand in the non-farm sector and leads to fast overall economic growth and disproportionately fast poverty reduction, closing the productivity gap within agriculture is the core task. So what is it about the lower parts of the agricultural labor productivity distribution in African agriculture that hold them back and what can we do to help there? The aggregate data tell us that we haven't been making fast advances in labor productivity. This is a, a plot, this type of graphic was made famous by two agricultural economists, Vern Rutan and Yujiro Hayami many years ago. This plots output per unit area per hectare on the horizontal axis, output per worker labor productivity on the vertical axis, and these diagonal lines are where you keep the productivity ratio the same. So movements along that line are equal productivity growth in both land and labor terms. Arrows that are more shallow sloped than those uh, diagonal dashed lines, the productivity growth is mainly in terms of units of land. It, land productivity is growing faster than labor productivity. Conversely, those that are much more steeply sloped labor productivity grows more fast than that of land. And the obvious pattern in sub-Saharan Africa is land productivity has been growing much faster than labor productivity. That the, the orientation of agricultural productivity growth in sub-Saharan Africa has been principally towards increasing the returns to land. It's been yield focused. Yield is the measure we commonly think of, but yield is output per hectare. It's not output per worker. And People are poor, land can be poor quality, but land isn't poor. Uh, people are poor and improving labor productivity is the centerpiece to, to reducing poverty. But across Africa, a lot of the technological change has really been focused on increasing the returns to land. Part of this comes from innovations, modern inputs like inorganic fertilizer, agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, uh, and one thing that we see across Sub-Saharan Africa is a huge variation in rates of uptake of these modern inputs. Um, there's a large population of development observers, and especially people who talk about development but don't spend much time in the field, who talk about peasant agriculture and talk about African farmers as if they don't use modern inputs. And, and these data tell us that that's clearly wrong as a generalization. There are large areas of Africa now. These happen to be countries where we have very large scale, high quality, nationally representative household survey data sets. Big parts of Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Malawi have fertilizer use rates that are well in excess of 50%. So most farmers are using inorganic fertilizers, contrary to the myth of the peasant farmer who's using nothing but his hands and a hoe. You even have very high rates of agrochemicals use, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. Uh, indeed, I would argue disturbingly high rates. This is also associated with human health problems because there's not a whole lot of use of precautionary equipment and not adequate familiarity with the toxicity of a number of chemicals. But you have this uptake of innovations that's clearly been happening across Sub-Saharan Africa 
over the last 10 to 15 years, strongly associated with the relatively rapid growth we've seen. Remember the countries on that list of fast growing economies, places like Ethiopia, we don't have good data in Rwanda, good nationally representative data in Rwanda and Ghana, but you see in the non-nationally representative data similar patterns. A lot of uptake of modern inputs in those economies associated with faster economic growth, faster poverty reduction, but leaving big gaps. Across space, it's very uneven. Within locations, it's also uneven. Part of that is that there are really heterogeneous returns to these inputs. Fertilizer is an example. On the right is a map of Malawi. Uh, a group of us used nationally representative fertilizer trial data across Malawi and climate data. And we can simulate what the estimated probability of fertilizer being profitable at pretty high spatial resolution. And what that graphic tells you is that there's huge variation from the light shaded areas where the profitability of fertilizer is relatively low, or conversely, the frequency with which you'd make money applying fertilizer is low, to places shaded dark where the frequency of fertilizer proving profitable for a farmer is very high. And the drivers of that are soils, it's rainfall patterns, it's access to market, because you pay more for fertilizer, the farther you have to transport it, you get less for your crop, the further you are away from the markets where you sell it. Similar sorts of patterns in Ethiopia. And there are a whole range of studies in recent years that demonstrate this heterogeneity of the returns to modern agricultural inputs, which helps us to understand why you have this patchwork of adoption. It doesn't help us to understand quite as well how to stimulate more uptake. And if stimulating productivity growth to drive faster labor productivity growth is part of what we need to undertake to help with rural poverty reduction, answering the questions around why we see this heterogeneity is really important. Similarly, one of the most puzzling things I've found in data in Africa is the seeming lack of synergistic use of different things. So these are plot level data from Ethiopia and from Niger that show of the whole population of farmers in Ethiopia, let me use this left graphic, we see that about 63% were using inorganic fertilizer. We see that 15.5% plus 2.3 plus 0.2 plus 0.6, so 18.6% of Ethiopian plots were using improved seed. But of that, only 2.3 plus 0.2, so 2.5%, were using both improved seed and fertilizer. Most of the farmers using fertilizer were not using improved seed, and most of the farmers using improved seed weren't using fertilizer. A few of you probably know a lot more agronomy than I do. I can't explain that, because that sort of contravenes everything an agronomist tells you, that, that most of the hybrid, hybrid improved seed are built to help absorb nutrients, so they do much better when you apply fertilizer. Conversely, fertilizer has its highest return when coupled with germplasm that is ready to physiologically take up the added nutrients better. And irrigation just further complicates the story. Although we do see that at least most of the irrigated plots are using other modern inputs. But the untapped potential of the synergies between irrigation, fertilizer, and modern seed is one of, in my mind, the real puzzles of contemporary African agriculture. We see this in Ethiopia, we see it in Niger, We've played with a few other plot level data sets, you get the same pattern repeating. So for those of you thinking about what are good thesis topics, figuring out why we aren't seeing more of the synergistic use of inputs, which can drive improved productivity, it's a great topic for, for further exploration. We do see that there's a big difference in input application rates for modern inputs by plot size. The bigger the plot, the lower the application rate, the less likely farmers are to apply modern seed or, or fertilizer at all, without getting into the weeds on this. There are a lot of reasons for, uh, for, for why this seems to happen, there, or I should phrase that differently. There are a lot of contending explanations. We don't yet have a convincing one. Uh, one or another paper can completely dismiss uh, each of the prevailing hypotheses around why we see these inverse relationships between productivity and plot size or farm size. Um, 
and we don't yet have any consensus at all why this happens, even though this has been studied for upwards of 100 years. It started being studied in, in, in Russia just after the, the communist revolution, believe it or not, and it's continued to this day. We still don't have good answers. Um, when we look at the variation, the plot level variation in input use, we see that the single biggest explanatory variable is something about the country. When we control for all the biophysical variables around a plot, the rainfall, the soil quality, elevation, all sorts of other things, we control for socioeconomic variables about the household, farm characteristics, what crops they're planting, how far they are from market, et cetera. We find that most of the explanatory power in regressions using, I'm trying to remember how many, it's like 23,000 plot level observations. By far the majority of the ex explicable variation in use of inputs is just a country dummy. It's just something about being in Nigeria or being in Malawi as opposed to being in Uganda or Niger. So it's something about policy, culture, don't quite know what it is, it's a black box. But even when you control for all the locally varying covariates, most of the explanatory power is national level, which tells us that there is some real leverage in country scale policy, national development strategies, macro policy, what have you, that seems to matter to uptake of modern inputs. We also know that the return to research and development in agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa is very high. So this is work done by folks at the University of Minnesota, Phil Pardee and his colleagues. This is the distribution of internal rates of return on dollars spent in agricultural R&D. In Sub-Saharan Africa in the solid line, the rest of the world ROW in the dashed line. And the thing you should really notice here is in Sub-Saharan Africa, the median internal annual rate of return or mean average rate of return 35 to 42%. I wish I could get that on my retirement account. This is a phenomenal rate of return. What this is telling us is we are underinvesting massively in agricultural R&D in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are very large returns out here. You don't know any given investment what kind of result you're going to get. Sometimes you'll get a negative rate of return, you'll get nothing, you'll have just wasted the money. Other times you'll double your money or better, but if you just look at what are the probabilities of getting a pretty high return, they're extremely attractive. The world is not investing enough, and African governments aren't investing enough in uh, agricultural returns. Markets are active, contrary to the myth of the subsistence farmer, a term I despise. Farmers raise food for their families, yes, but the idea of subsistence, somebody who's disengaged from markets, just flies in the face of any interaction you have with farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. They're hiring workers or they're hiring out their family members. They're renting in or renting out land, many of them. They're certainly buying and selling food and inputs. They're very heavily engaged in markets. Markets just don't particularly work well for them. So these are data from across Sub-Saharan Africa showing us the proportion of households hiring workers. As you can see in a place like Uganda, almost half of farm households hire workers far more hire out their own family members, by the way. So this is sort of the conservative way of approaching it. You get similar sorts of things for land. Land is a much more complicated transaction, and yet a quarter to 40% uh, to of, of farming households are renting in or borrowing in land. Uh, there are a lot of transactions. There are plenty of opportunities for people to buy and sell and rent in labor, land, and other markets. The market failures, meaning that the market doesn't work quite the way we project it to in economics textbooks. There are all sorts of costs to participating in markets, all kinds of risks, not good contract enforcement. People will cheat you frequently given half the opportunity. So you need to spend a lot of time and attention on how will I make sure that this guy who promises to buy my macadamia nuts really shows up and buys them. I don't just have a pile of rotting nuts with nothing to show for it. These are very real issues. The issue is not the existence of a market. The existence is how well the markets function. A very subtle but important difference. Market access matters a great deal for people, but the big drivers are often these frictions. So this is actually a study 
few of us did on what happens when you have oil shocks. People think of oil shocks like happened in 2008 or 2011 as driving food prices higher because the costs of production are higher if you have petroleum or you have hydrocarbons based fertilizers. But the real issue is the transport costs. The transport costs are actually the thing driving the rapid rise in prices in especially landlocked areas of sub-Saharan Africa. This is a plot that shows us distance from port of entry from a port uh, like Dar es Salaam, never mind why we call Kampala and Addis Ababa ports of entry in this particular exercise, but Mombasa and Dar es Salaam are intuitive. Um, and this is the difference between oil having a bigger impact or maize having a big, the global oil price shock having a bigger impact or the global maize price shock. And what's striking here is that the further you get from port, the more that the oil prices in the global markets are driving what's happening in the distant market food prices. So in Nakuru, the food price, the maize price is driven more by shocks to global oil markets than by shocks to global maize markets, which is a slightly astounding thing when you think about it, that it is less tied to the market globally in the crop you're transacting than it is to the market globally in the fuel that moves the crop back and forth between the ports. It's just a sign of how much the performance of the market matters to what households face day to day in terms of the prices fetched for the things they sell and the prices they pay for the food they buy. This matters because the vast majority of food in Africa is grown in Africa. We hear all sorts of stuff about how import dependent Africa has become in its food economy. But look at these two scales. This is the value of production and of exports. And this is the production, the domestic production consumed, the percentage consumed. You see that the percentage consumed has this weird trough in 1997, 98, but it's consistently 85, 90% of the food consumed in Africa or food consumed in an African country was grown in that same country. So to be clear, this is not aggregating across the continent. This is national scale data. So we count as an import food that comes from Nigeria into Niger. Food is a highly local thing. Yes, please. Congo's had conflict that whole period. Um, yeah, we never quite figured out exactly what's going on there. That's not driven by Congo as an outlier. Um, there are a bunch of countries that had this drop that year, and we haven't quite figured out whether it's an accounting thing or a real thing. Um, so I just sort of ignore that and look at the broader pattern that there's something weird about the data that one year that I've never figured out. Yes, please. Well, I believe 98 was like one of the first really severe droughts associated with climate change. And if that's essentially why you think it could be the indicator for the future? Yeah, that, that's a possible explanation because that affects more countries. Keep in mind that this is an average across all African countries. Um, that said, there were several other years of very severe drought. So 2001 was a really serious drought year in both Southern Africa and, and West Africa um, and parts of the Horn. Again, there, I don't quite know why that one observation is so low, but the takeaway point here is that you see the line for total production, you see the line for exports, and pretty similar line imports is just slightly above it. These, there's just a vast gap here. The food consumption in Africa is disproportionately African grown, so the, the markets in Africa need to work. You can't just rely on trade. Trade is important to stabilize prices, but the vast majority of the food flow is going to be arising from domestic production and domestic exchange. There is a lot of progress in especially output markets, things like the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange. For those who don't know who she is, Eleni Gabra Medin, a Cornell alumna, class of what, 86 or something. Uh, she went on to do a PhD at Stanford, was doing research on food marketing in Africa, and after a while decided, why am I studying this? I should solve the problem. So she came up with the Ethiopian Commodities Exchange. This is a real-time trading board in Yabello in a dusty little town in the south of Ethiopia. 
it's just mind blowing. You come in this town and the prices are changing. I can't read any of this, but the prices are changing. Farmers know what the Addis Ababa market is doing, just like farmers in the U.S. know what the Chicago Board of Trade prices are at any given moment. And that makes sure there's a level playing field and farmers can make better informed choices. These sorts of innovations in, in information delivery to farmers are significantly helping improve output market performance. There's quite a good body of literature now on this. On the right, you have an example of a cooling tank in a small place in Madagascar where contract farming uh, has led to the, the rise of, of improved processing, like these local cooling tanks, small farmer co-ops, 10, 15 families pool their milk together. Each day it goes into a cooler later in the day. The truck comes by, picks up the milk, takes it off to the processing plant where yogurt and ice cream and other things are made. And the farmers are getting much higher return for milk, much of which was previously lost to spoilage. We also see the growth of the non-farm side, you know, this little place in, in Benin, where uh, you, you see, for those who can read French, you can see that they're teaching people how to do data entry, how to do uh, any of it, kind of low-grade coding, all sorts of things. We see this large migration into the non-farm sector. Note that it's not necessarily a large migration into cities. Indeed, the fastest poverty reduction taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa today is in secondary towns. A nice piece of work by Luke Christensen, another Cornell alum, migration out of agriculture into the missing middle yields more inclusive growth patterns and faster poverty reduction than agglomeration in megacities. And it's based off of things like this. You need the basic infrastructure. There has to be electricity for you to be able to develop call centers, which are springing up across several different Anglophone and Francophone countries in Africa, as you have an adequate population of well-educated people speaking European languages with high-speed connections now. So you know, when you call up to reserve your room in Holiday Inn, uh, I'm trying to remember what they told me the percentage of their calls are now, but something like 20% of the calls are being answered in one of two African call centers that Holiday Inn is now using. So you're not calling Memphis, Tennessee anymore the way you once were. Uh, and it's all because of the rise of high-speed trunk lines and electrification that gets to secondary towns that are affordable and people can get good jobs. Um, we see that there's change in, uh, in the composition of the labor force and incomes. I probably don't have time to go through this in detail. Trust me that the way to interpret this is that across a wide range of economies, we see that increasingly, and especially among the better off uh, households, you're increasingly seeing quite diversified portfolios of activity and increasingly migrating out of agriculture into the non-farm side. Um, one of the big innovations, as many of you are aware, is the rise of mobile telephone services. In many ways, Sub-Saharan Africa has leapfrogged the United States. I literally get better phone reception in a couple of my long-term research sites in rural Kenya than I do in my house in Lansing. Um, but the big innovation in Kenya is M-Pesa, the mobile money system, Pesa's money in Swahili. Um, M-Pesa now is something like 30% of the banking system, 30% of deposits are in M-Pesa. It's kind of mind-blowing if you think about it. And a careful study done on M-Pesa by Tavneet Suri at MIT and Billy Jack at Georgetown, published in Science a year and a half ago, finds that just the rollout of M-Pesa has lifted about 200,000 households out of extreme poverty and induced 185,000 women to switch into business, leaving agriculture as their primary occupation. And because now they have independent financial intermediation off their phones, they don't have to walk to a bank, they don't have to ask their husband, they can now engage in enterprises that are more remunerative for them than their underemployed crop, rain-fed crop agriculture was previously. Um, so these technological innovations are really important in part because they help us to solve some of the market problems. I won't get bogged down too much in this, uh, but a few of, I think the students who are enrolled in this course, this is actually the paper you're supposed to, to take a look at, this Journal of African Economies paper that several of us published last year, where we talk about the structural transformation of rural Africa, and where there are six broad classes of policy interventions. The first is physical and institutional infrastructure. 
Markets are everywhere. They just don't work particularly well in most places. And remedying those deficiencies is maybe the single biggest thing that we can do to help rural Africans. That's the magic of M-Pesa. It leapfrogs the problems of poor access to banks and unreliable institutional response to banks. Anybody's, I've, I've spent more of my life than I would like arguing with small bank officers in small towns in Africa who decided that it would take a couple of weeks before they could release my project money so I could pay my field staff. Uh, and you're trying to figure out why this bureaucracy, what's the problem, and there's, God only knows what the real reason is. Um, but removing these sorts of impediments is huge. Water and soil constraints are very real. Again, less than 10% of African agriculture is irrigated, and soil nutrient fluxes are not attractive. We're losing nitrogen and phosphorus in particular very quickly in heavily cultivated soils without adequate nutrient replenishment. Um, new technologies are coming out, but very little of it is developed in Africa for Africans. The underinvestment in African R&D means we have these very high unrealized returns, and we have very incomplete adoption because so many of the technologies are very heterogeneous returns in these landscapes because they typically weren't really developed for those landscapes. They were developed elsewhere, imported over, and adapted. Um, the post-harvest value chain is a very big deal. This is where most of the growth in agricultural profitability in Europe and North American development came in the 20th century. We're early days in this in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, rural financial institutions, and PESA being an example, is important, and uh, human capital. Healthy workers, educated workers, or more productive workers. Hopefully all students here believe that. Um, early on I mentioned this index-based livestock insurance product, especially the Sharia-compliant version, index-based livestock Tuckful. Uh, which is offered by Tuckful Insurance Agency in Kenya, a for-profit insurer that takes very seriously its obligations to the predominantly Muslim populations that are its primary clientele and its share owners, its equity owners. They're trying to make money, and they are making money by offering this insurance product, but it's also solving very real problems that their clients face when they lose animals. Companies are making money by solving the problems that these populations face. Now, they sometimes design bad products, and holding companies responsible when they develop bad products, especially if there's misleading sales, that's a real issue, and in some places it's hard to enforce contracts well. But it doesn't have to happen just through the development banks, through the government-sponsored and multilateral-sponsored agencies. That's part of the solution, but it's not by any stretch most of it. M-Pesa is an entirely private operation. That was rolled out by the private, uh, by, by Safaricom, uh, by the private mobile telephone operator that realized, hey, we're putting phones in people's hands. The phone could do more things than just make calls, and we can make money if we get them to rely on us. So it's solved a real problem. My observation is the ones that do best focus on the things they do well, and they find partners to work with who do the other things well. So banks that try to get into agricultural extension commonly do a bad job at the agricultural extension, and as they try to improve that, they start to degrade the quality of their banking services. When they work with agricultural input distribution companies that are pretty good, or C companies that are pretty good, they develop effective partnerships. Um, not everybody does it, but that's true worldwide. I mean, they're, that's why most businesses fail. Most startups fail because it's hard to make a business work well. But the secret to making it work well is usually do something that you can do really well, that you can now compete most others, and then find partners who do the complementary things. Personally, I think that's the answer in, in most of these situations. Yes, sir.